Hi, I'm Caitlin. And this is Abby. Uh, we are going to talk about recruitment to residency programs. So just kind of going over the purpose of this is just, for one, highlight the need for this and uh, to go over sort of the current practices among programs. So many of you in here are already program directors, so you probably got our survey that was circulated uh, last week, uh, sort of asking what programs were doing on this front already and gathering some data. So we're going to include that in this presentation. In, as part of that survey and part of this discussion is to talk about the barriers to expanding uh, recruitment to sexual and gender minorities and to kind of talk about some recruitment strategies that we have employed that we found successful and some that have emerged through the survey that look promising as well. So the way this is going to, we're hoping this is going to work, <laughs> is if everyone wants to get out their phones, this is going to involve some audience participation. <laughs> um, we are going to give a quick overview of sort of, you know, the issue at hand and then pose each of the questions that we're going to discuss with our panelists up on the poll anywhere kind of get the room's take on each of the questions, and then kind of family feud style, see what the survey respondents <laughs> said, <laughs> and then um, kick it to the panel and see what the panelist has to say about it. And then we'll rinse and repeat <laughs> for each question. And then at the end, we can talk about some strategies that we can take away from all of this discussion, hopefully, and you can bring back. So um, our panelists today, we've got Adam McFarlane is here from uh, Boston Medical Center. He is a second year resident, and uh, he's going to be sitting here. We have uh, Melissa White, and she is program dir director at Emory. And uh, Joel Moore, who is also program director at VCU. So we're going to talk a little bit about the data and issues with self-identifying, because it's very hard to recruit when you can't identify the population you're trying to recruit. <laughs> and there is no marker on ARES for people to disclose um, sexual and gender uh, issues here, or issues, identities, excuse me, <laughs> for some people. Um, and so this is definitely like a point of contention. 15% uh, of medical school applicants feared that this would, ex would affect their acceptance, and when surveying residency applicants, only a third of LGBT identified residency applicants planned to disclose. And a good 15% just full out were not going to. And half people were really trying to decide whether or not this is something they wanted to do. It was, it was ambiguous. Factors that negatively influence disclosure were um, male gender, uh, sexual and gender identification other than gay and lesbian, so bisexual, trans, queer. Um, East Asian race and medical schools in sort of the south, uh, southern regions and the central U.S. So as far as what uh, SGM residents look for or applicants look for in their residencies, um, you have to click for me, my dear. Oh, sure. Thank yes. you. Um, so there was a great piece put out by, actually by SAM a few years ago that looked at factors across the board that resident applicants looked at and considered when choosing what residencies to apply to and then ultimately match. Um, in the top 10, and actually number 10, 14% of respondents said that diversity was the most important thing to them, so it ended up number 10 on the list. But then they also took the data and quantified it out to top three, and so actually 28% of the respondents put it in the top three, which is interesting because it goes, that 28% is overrepresentative of what the diversity within EM. So there's what we would say is non-diverse applicants that are also considering this, which I think is something people kind of outside this room want to think that this is only a concern of diverse identified residents, and it's actually not. This is like a global actual consideration. Um, it heavily influences section, sexual and gender minorities. Um, their identification with that group heavily influences their career choice and their residency selection. So another piece um, that's in our references, but they, a study looked at uh, specialty prestige is inversely re proportionate to the representative SGM within that specialty. Um, and actually the medical school you went to had no weigh in on that. So it didn't matter how prestigious the medical school was, 
if you identified as a sexual or gender minority, you were less likely to want to go into what is considered a prestigious, like most selective type of line of work. And the big factor was this was lack of mentorship and feelings that these, uh, these areas of training are less welcoming to that population. And so, and then in Canada, they sent out a qualitative survey that looked at um, SGMs and kind of their considerations and the perceived acceptance. So even if you are like, man, I don't have any of these residents, like how am I ever going to recruit? It's actually portraying the acceptance rather than actually having the numbers to back it up because there is a limited population to choose from and there's a lot of residencies, we get that. But you want to portray that acceptance and that will have a bigger pool with the residents than actually knowing there is a gay, lesbian, or otherwise resident in that program. So related outcomes. There was a great study, or a paper out of Howard University, actually, um, this year, and it looked at diversity type studies across all kinds of healthcare outcomes, financial, business. Every single study they looked at, and I think it was over 20, had positive outcomes. And they did, they broke it down by innovation, so more diverse programs are more innovative. They're more profitable. They have better patient outcomes. All the things we've kind of already talked about today. Um, it's a really great paper. And then, as in the age of resident wellness, um, there's a few papers out there that have shown that actually not being able to disclose whether they choose to or not, uh, in the sense of, is my program welcoming, but I just choose to not disclose, or is my program not welcoming, and that's why I don't disclose, it still increases stress among your residents, which means more issues, decrease overall mental health. And then, like we said before, selling this to people outside this room or who are aware of these um, issues and this need for diversity can be difficult, but when you quantify it and how they will reap re reward outside of just having a picture of residence that looks nice and different can really help sell the point to people who might be obtuse to this idea from the beginning. So, get out your phones, poll everywhere. Let us know, Team Aria, let me hear you. I wanna make sure everyone can log in. This is a free text, so if you don't know what Game of Thrones is, please feel free. Um, Team Sansa. I, I don't know, I feel like I'm Tyrion. <laughs> Team Ghost. Didn't get petted. Okay. <laughs> Pinocchio is also an acceptable response, or anyone else? Yourself? Don't don't tell yourself short. You can rule the Iron Throne. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> right? Oh. Ooh. Plot twist. <laughs> Lots of snow. Gilly, love it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Okay. Is everyone? Is anyone else having? I was going to say, is anyone right? having any problems or anything? <laughs> Spoiler alert! Spoilers. <laughs> hey, I didn't just, just you know. Tyrion, the hound. I like that. Yeah. Need to. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> Someone needs to catch up. <laughs> you guys are great. All right. All right. <laughs> so we have our, yeah, okay, John sounds, Snow. Seems we'll like see. Everyone's in. He would actually have to do something. But anyway, so, so for our first question, so does your program have a formalized way to actually recruit SGM applicants to your residency? So as a program director or recruitment team, do you have a strategy? Do you have a, you say to your folks in your residency, like, this is how we're going to do this. All right, so kind of overwhelmingly, no, not, not super surprising. Um, and like I said, so here's the data from the, no, wait, oh, wait, I'm sorry, back to back, I forgot. Yeah. Um, so if you do, for those of you who answered yes. Uh, yeah, for those of you who answered yes, please 
kind of, you can multi-vote, so you can vote for each one that your residency actually does. And then, of course, the all-encompassing other. No one's othering today. Okay, so it looks like That's mostly good. brochures, um, contact information, Outlast. hosting second look experiences seems pretty evenly divided up. All right, so survey says, in terms of whether or not you do any active recruitment, pretty overwhelmingly was no um, among program directors. And for those, that very small subset of people who said yes, because it was sort of a smart flow survey, so this is a very small N, um, what they did do was um, similar, like brochure packets, um, contact information, maybe having a point person, and um, second look, so pretty reflective of what's going on in the room. Um, so why don't we turn this to our panelists, these two questions, and then we'll rinse and repeat with a couple more. So <clears throat> the really, really hard thing about this that you've already alluded to is you have no idea who in the room identifies as LGBT. And one of the things we do as a raw global strategy is slide number two is everyone is welcome to come here. And we put that out there and that really causes a lot of people across the spectrum of diversity to open up during their interview because it gives them permission to talk. And so. But not everybody. You know, as an openly gay male program director, you would think that the gay males that come in interview would tell me, hey, I'm gay too, and ask me questions. And sometimes they're afraid to. There's a real fear and stigmata that unfortunately is coming back into the, the society that we live in right now. And so you have to give the opportunity, but it's always hard to identify. So I think giving the opportunity is the key thing from that standpoint. Um, if they do come out and say, I have questions or I want to know how it fit in there, then it's really important they talk to other peer residents in the program that are LGBT or, um, or allies or what have you and understand that what it's like to be in your city because for some people that's a real concern, especially based on what their past experiences have been. Yeah, I, I agree with Joel. Um, we actually don't have a formal program per se. But we are unabashedly like aware and present the diversity and that, that is very important to us at Emory. Um, and that goes to saying that right up front um, on top of reverse recruiting because we really don't want people to be there unless they want to be there and being an academic urban um, center, it brings its own nuances. And so the, the harder part for us is with all the applicants, how do you narrow down the ones that you're looking for? So that's kind of the first question. And then the second one, is when they are there on interview day, we do put up those slides, we do show the videos, it is on our website, um, we could do a better job on our website, but, but we make it very clear that that, that, is, that is our passion and that we want to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And, um, and so when I do have an individual, really it's, I find that it's more so in their personal statement because um, that's where I find their passion. If, they're gonna, if they are going to put that in their personal statement, I'm gonna make sure that I gravitate towards them and make sure that I'm meeting them where they're at. For example, I had an applicant this past year who um, you could tell that this was a passion of hers, but when she came to interview with us, she was dressed very differently, so I pulled her aside into my office and I said, can you tell me what your pronouns are? You know, I'd like to talk to you about, about this based on your personal statement. And she was like, oh my gosh, you're one of the first people that has ever asked me that on the interview trail. And so I think that, that that's kind of I make, we try and make that as clear. Now, it's not always the case, and sometimes it's very difficult. And like Joel said, that's a personal um, decision for individuals to come out and do that. But I think you can also see a lot in their <coughs> personal statement and going back to kind of what have people done in residency. And does that speak to your mission, vision, and values of your program? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> I think one, of the, one of the major things is that, um, you know, going recently through this process, is, um, you know, I made it a very big point to be very open about my sexuality because I didn't want to be at a place where I didn't feel welcome. Um, and there's a very big difference between places where I felt like even if I um, was not open about my sexuality, I'd still walk away and feel very welcome. And I think that should at the minimum be a goal that you have, is if somebody who 
is not open about their sexuality leaves your interview day saying that I can feel comfortable being here, I can be myself here, whether or not I choose to disclose some information. Um, it made a big difference when programs had, um, you know, even something as simple as a brochure um, that was open and saying we're welcoming, we're out there, we want you to be here. Um, having program directors say, oh yeah, like I have, you know, three residents that you can um, reach out to and have a conversation with before you leave today, versus the program directors that are like, you know, I don't, I don't know if any of my residents are gay actually. Or just being like, oh, you know, you're the first person on the interview trail today who's actually discussed sexual orientation with me. Um, you know, maybe I can email you some resources and then never following up. So it's, there's, there's um, a really, really um, big thing to be said for just having something being visible out there and, and open um, and just to, to promote that welcoming environment. Yeah, I, I just add in, <clears throat> I can't emphasize enough how it, breaks my heart every year when I see people who have done amazing accomplishments in the LGBT education, advocacy, what have you, and they remove everything of it from their application. They may have had it in their medical school application, but because residency in a lot of states don't have protection against employment discrimination, they take it all off and they take a lot of their accomplishments off. And so I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that if you're a sexual minority, that you if you, you may take a lot of what is about you off your application because of that concern. So it's important to be out there as a program for those who are not comfortable being out there as an applicant. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So next question. <clears throat> so what are the barriers that you, what is the, the biggest barriers you feel like identifying and recruiting um, these folks? And you can multi-vote this one as well. Love and the honesty, thank you. Awesome. So as something that's, this is kind of uh, the underwater of our whole presentation is identifying these folks is really hard and it's a multifaceted thing. Some of it's very personal in the applicant and obviously some of it's the program and just society in general. But um, as you can see from the PD results. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Yes, this is our big thing. Would you, do you feel like support a uh, click box. It would not be like a mandatory, like you can't submit your application without checking yes or no. It would for, be very voluntary. All right, votes are in. Okay, very so the PD results. So yeah, um, I think it's a pretty common theme. Uh, difficulty identifying applicants and we're gonna get into that a little bit more with some of the later questions um, I think a really important really honest answer to this question is that I don't know how to approach it mm -hmm. and we had a free text response in this survey that was really enlightening hearing kind of what program directors across the country felt um, in terms of their discomfort um, some people are very open with their discomfort or not really seeing a need for it or um, just, it, it wasn't even on their radar. And I think that that's, that's interesting. I think it's also really interesting to, to note the geography and political climate. I think that came up also in the data before that you know where you are, where you're in school has a lot about whether or not people feel comfortable getting into this with you. And then in terms of the uh, disclosure box, a little bit more split than this room. <laughs> And um, actually some of the free text answers to this were, were similar. People had fears about the legality of it, that you know, asking people this explicitly, is, does this venture into discriminatory practices? Um, that being said, a lot of, you know, 
a lot of the literature about people's discomfort is like, how do I do it? Because there is no box. Do I put it in my personal statement? Maybe I didn't do any LGBT like activities. I mean, I don't know how to put this in. I don't have a partner to casually, casually mention. So, you know, there's definitely something for that too. Also, there's, you know, when I'm trying to do the lit review for this presentation, there's just a paucity of data because we are not counting them. Because there is no box, there is no data. And that's, that's also something to consider. I'm sorry, that we'll get to our soapbox later. <laughs> how, how about you guys? Did you mean to bias everything? I got nervous. <laughs> Could you go back, maybe like yeah. two slides to the other one? The, uh, yeah, that one. This one, yeah. Um, so I guess one of my curiosities would be, so the, the result that says difficulty identifying LGBTQ students as um, sort of a barrier to recruitment, I'm curious, so if you knew somebody was LGBTQ, what sort of practices would that change for you? Because for me, I, you know, it's, you know, I only have my experience, but I, you know, if you're able to identify somebody as an LGBTQ applicant, I guess, like, would you approach that conversation differently? Um, would you have more materials for them that you wouldn't already have? I guess I'm just curious what, what people's thoughts are on that. I mean, for myself as a program director, if I know somebody's in that situation, I will contact them with, I'll offer them contact with some of our LGBT residents mm -hmm. to say, if you have questions, this person's happy to talk to you. And I think that's, that's a key connection, mm -hmm. um, because even being LGBT myself, I mean, they don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from me. Sure. I, I, guess, I guess my point is, like, those are all things that should be offered anyway, in my opinion. Um, so I'm just not sure, like, maybe I'm just, like, on a different level. Like, so I guess my thought about, like, being accessible and open, to me, those are things that I would hope would already be there, um, rather than like waiting for somebody to self-identify. So that's just sort of my confusion with that, that question. I feel a lot more comfortable talking to someone about their LGBTQ status and, and interests and thoughts if I can identify it in their application in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise, I don't want to give the impression that it's an issue for me, I guess. Like, I, I think our general residency culture is very welcoming of LGBTQ folk um, and that, that that comes across pretty clearly in the course of a day for us. Um, but in terms of directly having those conversations with someone, unless it's a thing for them, I don't necessarily want to have them perceive that it is a thing for me because I would be afraid that they would interpret that as it's like a big deal for me. Like, ooh, you know, whoa, are you LGBTQ? Um, as opposed to just kind of sort of something that's important in terms of diversity, but not a barrier for me or the program in any way. Is that? This is more of like a funny kind of story, but there's a, uh, we had our second look, uh, diversity second look event, and then there was one uh, applicant student who was, who, who's out, and that's who we, all, we include everyone in our second um, look events, and then one of our faculty members said, hey, to our, one of our gay residents, hey, take him out, just show him a good time. So it was one of those things where it was like, hey, you can be included into this city. It was actually kind of fun, and he, he loved it. He thought it was really funny. Another funny thing that happened is that resident was actually supposed to be on a date that night. <laughs> so a little bit weird for just two seconds before they got rid of that one. But I think it can help with a little bit of inclusion and, and, and the social aspect of not just the program, but what is it going to be like hanging out with your, your fellow residents. Um, yeah, usually it's if they are self-identified. It's if, if they are self-identified. Yeah, I would just like to strongly say you can't and shouldn't approach somebody who's not willing to share that with you. It's just, it's just going to make somebody incredibly uncomfortable and potentially be traumatic. And then the question is, you know, do you with this checkbox, you know, is it a mandatory box that you have to fill? Is it an optional box? I think all the demographic box. ones are optional. It's like click what applies. So then if you don't answer it, then can you not bring it up? Do you know what I mean? So I, I identify as a black queer woman and um, grew up in Texas. And I left as soon as I could when I turned 18. Um, 
But when I was trying to choose what specialty to go into, and then subsequently what resident, residency to put at the you know, high end of my, my rank list, my match list, uh, I chose Highland, actually, to be number one, because one, it's in the Bay Area, and like queer people are safe there, right? More safe than other pe places. So geographically, but then also, I heard about the program through a senior resident who was also a black queer woman who, had, I, had, who I had met in a, like a mentorship dinner thing through a different organization. So I think that like she is the reason I chose Highland. She got me into shadow her. She was respected and kind of being a badass, you know, black queer woman out in a very out way and being celebrated in the program. And so I immediately saw her and her partner and the attending for the day just owning things and that, that sealed the deal for me. So that's, that's like the end of one experience about how that how that can be powerful, having someone who's out and visible and celebrated for that part, but also like the, the many other parts of their identity. Any other thoughts and we can move on? All right. Love it. Okay, next question. All right, so kind of switching gears a little bit, does your residency include SGM health education. And I know now with ACGME, this is like more of a requirement, but uh, you'd be surprised. Loving, loving this honesty. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's true. I apologize. Sorry, this was geared for PDs who I hope would know their program. So, we apologize. The Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, next mm -hmm. question. And does, in that kind of same vein, does your residency include training on implicit bias as it relates to all implicit bias? One speaker's very popular. Hopefully you recruited them afterwards. Good. All right. All right. Vanna. All right. Survey says. <laughs> um, yeah, so most people said they had something. Um, and the mean number of hours that were dedicated to that in the curriculum was the average, it was 2.4 per year. Um, so probably about one or two lectures a year is, it seems to be the average for those that offer it. Um, but it's, there's still a good third of programs that don't have any curriculum whatsoever. And then in terms of implicit bias training, um, it looks like it was more, more often than not there was something um, and I, I was actually really pleased to see how many people had, how many programs had uh, stuff for residents and faculty, that this seems to be something um, that is picking up some momentum. And um, so I would just add in, yeah. um, having done the study in 2014 that looked at emergency medicine, that we had a 70% response rate from all programs. And at that point, only 25% of programs did anything. Yeah. And it was an average of 45 minutes to go. In five years, despite our political climate, to this improvement, I think it's not a little momentum. I think it's a thundercloud of momentum. That's so great. that's wonderful, and hopefully we can continue to make it keep going. Do you guys have any other thoughts? Putting on the spot, panelists. <laughs> I, I guess my, my thought on this is, um, you know, I think this is incredibly important, particularly for recruiting LGBTQI applicants. You know, we, um, none of us really exist in a, um, like a single identity group, right? Um, and, you know, you might have a pretty welcoming environment for somebody who identifies as gay, but maybe um, through some sort of implicit bias, um, their uh, ethnic identity or their socioeconomic identity becomes insulted and that can lead to um, them not choosing your program. 
I think it's sometimes pretty easy to put sexual minority in a box. That's sort of been my experience when, when talking about that in recruitment. It's just, um, I think these sort of programs are incredibly important. We do it at BMC, um, and I, it's one of the reasons why I chose to go there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thanks. I think, I think for us, um, although we're always constantly trying to work on the resident experience, I found that we're having a little bit more trouble with our faculty and, and really kind of keeping them, you know, going through training and, and really trying to be truthful and we've lost some really sentinel leaders within our department and in recruitment of a, of a chair. And um, so it's been interesting for us because the diversity that we almost expect within our institution just isn't there from a, a higher level. And so, um, I don't know, I just think it's a pretty big charge as well because yes, we're talking about residents here, but really it goes back to the faculty um, piece as well too because if you don't have it within your faculty and you're not actively recruiting, then your residents are also not going to kind of see it as well if your residents are not following the same track into your faculty position. So it's, I think for us, it's also really getting our faculty, you know, with that education. It's different. Yeah, and I will say just from our experience, quantity aside, um, you know, what you can't have in quantity maybe because of lack of resources or time, you can make with like really impactful um, efforts and, and seizing opportunities when you have them to make as much impact on your residents. And so we recently at Yale had a trans panel, um, and it was 40 minutes of uh, three representatives from the community in New Haven speaking about it, and they offered like three or four nuggets that I have heard residents and I myself have now incorporated into my practice in the ED in just that short period of time. So it makes a huge difference. And that was, they didn't do it on purpose, um, but it just happened to come out that way. But if you can like really focus, like they were like tweetable kind of nuggets. You know, they were like 140 characters, like here's a quick way to break the glass with a patient that you think might be transgender to make them know that this is a comfortable space. You know, that's very useful. One of them, the one that I use now, is when you walk into a room, if you have any inclination whatsoever, I immediately just introduce myself. I'm Dr. Abby Sacri, and I prefer she or her. How can I help you today? And I use it on a patient literally the day, the next day, and his face just lit up. And he actually wasn't transgender. But he was just so excited that this was like, you know, I could just see his reaction and how, what a difference it made for his patient experience. So, just, so there you go. You can follow our Twitter for more. <laughs> to, that, um, to that point, words have power, and yeah. that's something we all have to keep in mind. Yeah. That's why education is so important. Right. Then. Next. Okay. All right. So, for everyone in the room that looks at applications, how do you identify SGM applicants? What are kind of your techniques? And can everyone read these? I apologize to the, try to keep them large. Awesome. So predictably, you know, you out yourself in ARIS, it makes it a lot easier for everyone in the folks reading ARIS applications to actually know. Um, but I appreciate how many people kind of tune into some of these other, other kind of ways to, to put yourself out there that people might choose that's not as blanket as ARIS, since that goes to every program. And then a lot of applicants that we've talked to and worked with um, are, you know, they kind of select and choose that maybe a Midwest school they would not want to out themselves to and maybe somewhere on the East Coast they would and so ARIS kind of corners you if you put it in there it goes to everyone so uh, there's a lot of different ways that people can kind of get their message out there and put themselves out there that you can then pick up. So with the PD survey results again yeah a lot of people are trying to read the tea leaves and the ARIS application references, if they're there, um, mentions of same-sex partners. Um, but yeah, a, a good subset of people just aren't keeping track of this. Um, and that if they 
it, but it was, it's just not on their radar, basically. And that's kind of where we are. So for you guys, what do you, what do you guys do in your program? Do you guys keep track of it throughout the process? Do you invite people? You know, we don't, we don't keep track numbers per se, um, unlike the gender, which we're just getting to and, and the ethnicity. Um, you know, is it something that we should be doing? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, because if I can't tell exactly, you know, again, trying to read the tea leaves, then I'm going to miss some people. And, you know, being a, a straight woman who has a brother who is in the gay community, my passion is very different. It doesn't mean that I sh shouldn't be excluded as, as well. So yeah. um, I don't know. I, I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? We haven't had a lot of trouble recruiting um, in that respect. I mean, and I think it's because people just know of me and my situation, but um, but certainly trying to, again, get the word out there of our inclusivity in general um, certainly is helpful. But um, again, it's difficult because you, know, you go through reading the tea leaves, 1,500 applications, and sometimes you only come across a couple that you're like, wow, this person probably is LGBT. Because, you know, to Jeff's point before, they could be straight ally and they could be went fantastic and I want that person in my program just as much. Um, and I think that's really important, but I don't know because they do an activity that they are. And I, I just appreciate that they're an advocate for diversity and inclusive because um, that's, that's what I want. And I think we, we stumble upon more people than we probably strategically select. Hmm. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, you know, our recruitment efforts are very just um, diversity uh, in a broad sense mindset. I don't think we do anything that specifically targets LGBTQ applicants, um, aside from what they self-identify. But, um, you know, for me and I think for applicants afterward that I've talked to, just having that broad umbrella has been super, super helpful um, and, and been effective. Yeah. So. so when someone does self-identify, just to clarify on your point, do you guys keep track of it as part of the recruitment? No, no, we don't have like yeah, I mean, if, if it comes up as like a um, like a point in conversation, maybe, but there's no like formalized like right, identification right. for it. Yeah. All right. So just some takeaways. So overall, the you know, as queer applicants ourselves going through it, like we understand like this is a very personal choice for the applicant. Um, there's a lot of factors at play that have nothing to do with residency, family, culture, where geopolitical climate, all that stuff. Um, so we're not by any means saying that the onus is completely on the programs and that's the reason that, you know, queer applicants aren't outing themselves. That's 100 percent not true. Um, but we want to give you little small changes you can make that will speak very loudly to those who are listening, um, which I think is the goal. The reoccurring thing that we're hearing from everyone is like we want to create this environment. Sometimes you're not quite sure how. So. Um, first of all, as we know, diversity benefits everyone, and the more people in your program at the leadership level and faculty level that you can get on board to see this vision with you is, uh, well, you'll have the greater impact um, for recruiting residents, for recruiting faculty, and just fostering the environment um, that you want. So there's a lot of anxiety out there with medical students, particularly going to residency. Interesting statistics have shown from undergrad to medical school, there's a little bit less anxiety than medical school to residency. I think I would guess just some of the nature of the application process itself. But um, how can we reduce that anxiety would be kind of the thing I would say to shoot for. So to talk about some of the things that um, we did now that we're kind of not trying to bias the survey that's going on here. Um, so we uh, did this year start some new targeted efforts at Yale for LGBT recruitment. And we did uh, do pointed uh, invitation to disclose. And we kept track of who did disclose. And um, we communicated that to the rank team. Um, and it was kind of an interesting experience. Uh, obviously, you, we didn't like violate any laws in doing so. <laughs> it was a very sort of carefully crafted email that was sent to every person who was invited for uh, an interview. Uh, ju just saying very vaguely, we understand that the ARIS application does not have a box for every way in which you might identify diversely, code, code. If you would like to self-disclose using these words, 
um, feel free to reach out to members of the diversity committee and and so on and so forth. And we actually got overwhelmingly Huge. positive res responses. People yeah. were really eager for the opportunity um, to disclose that they didn't have it elsewhere. Um, so that was one, one approach we did. And then we did keep uh, a, a list and, you know, we talked to them once that conversation got discussed. And I think part of it being resident initiative takes some of it, uh, some of the pressure off. Um, and it, it allowed me as the follow-up person to say, you know, I really, I'm, I'm, I feel so privileged that you wanted to share that. Um, would this be something you would want us to share with the leadership as part of your process? And most people said yes. And um, then that, that allowed them to be included on the list for people for second look. If they were a competitive applicant and we were doing targeted diversity recruitment efforts, um, because we don't do an open invitation to self-invite to our, our recruitment stuff because we're a little bit shorter on budget, I guess, or something. Uh, it's a short list. <laughs> so you have to already be kind of ranked to match to, to get that invitation. Um, it allowed us to identify those people for our program director so that they could be invited. Um, and so those were also ways in which we were able to do it. And, and um, we actually doubled the number of LGBT applicants, not uh, residents in our program just by this next cl incoming class, which was a huge influx. It was really successful. Um, so we were really happy with that. Um, so that was one. Uh, in doing that, that made residents and faculty visible to them. Um, we do have an outlist at Yale that is just public information. You can Google outlist Yale and our photos are there. Um, and uh, there are emails and people can contact. So that also um, helps Harbor uh, create a safe environment. And um, we also would do little like cues. We would wear little rainbow pins to the like recruitment events, things like that. Um, sorry. Outlist. Outlist. Out out list. Yale Outlist. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the whole, it's the whole hospital. It's like a directory whole, yeah. of anyone who's Literally here everyone. in medicine. And huh? No, no like, not everyone does. No, um, we're saying that maybe it would be an idea though to yeah, so some institutions Google, do. Google, Yale yeah. happens to be one that does. Uh, and it, give, it puts up people's bios, like their research things, their contact information, if they're available to be a mentor. Um, and so that was another resource that we circulated to all applicants saying, you know, this is a resource we provide for all queer applicants and really anyone else who wants to do research in this area or advocate in this area. Yeah. This is a list of people who would be your community. Um, and then, of course, just visibility symbols, like things in the PowerPoint slide when you're like, this is our program, having a little inclusivity, making sure there's some imagery. We wore pins to all our little social gatherings, things like that. It's, uh, it's silly, but it works, because this is a community of people who are used to navigating society in the shadows. Like, we're very good at picking up little cues and, yeah, uh, nonverbals, and it's, it's huge. I mean, I actually wore a shirt one day last year that had like just the um, pink uh, triangle on it and most people have no idea what that means and I had like three applicants at the social that were like oh, I love your shirt and then just like blob about their life that had no and was great I mean I'm so happy you know they felt comfortable but it's just real little things and you know if you're outside that community it might seem like really a pin that makes a big difference it does okay it does <laughs> I don't think so. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's confusing, right? Yeah. It is. I, I, I mean, think it I invites it the conversation, which is what we want, right? So just, so even if they're like, oh, or you know, you're queer, and you're like, no, I'm not, you know, but it's a big passion of mine, and it's a big passion of this program, and we value what you bring to the program. Bam. They likely know someone who they can say, oh, but you could talk to Abby yeah. here. You know? Yeah. I think yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, the um I know which one you're talking about that like Oh it does. I think it does. Yeah, 100%. I think I would include and that in these sort of like nonverbal There's no there's no 
there's no lines like that, short of like respectable social lines, you know, obviously. Um, but actually, it's funny you bring that up because that was something with the trans panel, going back to what I learned from that just very short experience. Is that was one of my big fears when talking to folks in the trans community, like, am I going to offend them? You know, like, and the, unanimously that panel was like, just have the conversation. And if you put your foot in your mouth, say, I'm sorry, I didn't know, and move on. Because we know, we know the challenge of identifying and having these conversations and how uncomfortable it can be. So no, there, if someone opens up to you, feel free as that is an invitation to then open up to them and communicate your acceptance, your support, and your program's acceptance and support. Yeah, the only caveat I would potentially put on that is, I mean, just remember this is deeply personal to people, so you as a straight ally may be like, you know, you should just be yourself and be out and whatever, and that's right. great. And that's pretty much what I tell people as well. But I also tell them it's personal. It's your decision, not mine. So, you know, sometimes when you're not walking in those shoes, you just have to be a little careful to make sure that you're allowing them, you know, to do the decisions they're most comfortable with. Yeah. But, like, we have uh, an out resident in our program who is not out to anyone in his family at all. And he would be, like, banished if he were. But he has found a community. And I'm not saying as a plug for Yale. I'm saying that people can live that duality of life in residency, mainly because you spend 99% of your time <laughs> With residency and not with your family, but also, you know, like that can happen. So, you know, and I think that's an important space for this individual, and I bet it's an important space for individuals like him throughout the country. So, yeah, and I think it's like really important to understand that, like, for a lot of LGBTQ applicants, like, they're not just looking at a residency program, they're looking at um, their community, mm -hmm. right? Like, they're, they're choosing a community, they're choosing a safe space. And creating an environment that's really safe is so important. So, like, we do the rainbow um, stickers on our badges. Like, I literally bought a roll of 500 rainbow stickers, and I just pass them out to people, and I put them up in the, um, our sides, and the nurses take some, the techs take some. And we've gotten so many positive comments about developing a community that way. We had our first department-wide LGBTQ night this year, and so it's great to talk to an applicant and be like, hey, like, we have this strong community for you here. Like, we have, like, these resources. Like, we have people here that can support you and that are like you. Um, and I think that makes the world a difference for applicants. Mm -hmm. they, like, we're a group of people that's very, very focused on community because of the challenges that we've had to go through. Um, and to be helping develop that and say that we have that here is just so, so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and then importance of including them in the second look experience. I can't overstate that. And I'll, I'll tell my Denver story, I promise, maybe for the last time in my life, but probably not. Um, I was telling Jeff this, and I've told Dowen and Caitlin's heard it a hundred times, but when I um, interviewed, I interviewed at Denver as one of the places, I'm an East Coast girl. I did not see myself in the Rockies. Um, but I thought, Denver's cute, I'll go out there. Um, and the, the, the interview was nice, but it was nothing that kind of blew me away, and family things kind of dragged me to the East Coast, so Denver kind of fell off my interest list, if you will. And then I got an invite for a second look. Um, and I thought, well, that's weird, but okay, you know, I'll take it up, maybe I missed something. And I went out there and was absolutely blown away by my three days I spent there. Amazing. And it went to number two on my list, and I would be happy if I were standing here now as a Denver resident. Like, it is literally family, which is the number one thing residents, you know, consider. Overall, we know this. That kept me here, but I can't overstate how important that second look was to me, and that's an N equals one. But that's a huge impact. It can have a huge impact. And if you want these type of applicants, this, you know, and and now look, I'm still talking about it two years later, and I talk about it on the interview trail. To, I'm not afraid. If people are interviewing at Yale and they want to come here, that's freaking awesome. But I tell them, there's other awesome programs out there, and here's some you should check out, especially if you're in my community. Like, these people are good peoples. Go to these interviews, check them out. That's huge, and I don't think I'm the only person out there doing this, you know, that's giving my residency, my application experiences and talking about your programs out there. So the second look experience can be absolutely course changing for some people. So please consider including some of these folks. Okay, I kind of already got on the soap soapbox a little bit earlier about the heiress inclusion thing. Um, if we're getting personal, uh, I did not disclose on my application because I didn't really think there was a good way to put it in a personal statement. I seemed, like, this seems extraneous. 
random sentence about it. So it wasn't in there. But I think that it, had there been a box, I would have clicked that. And I think a lot of people feel that. And I think that for all the program directors that are saying, I don't know how to identify it, this is another solution to that. And I think also that, like I said, if you don't count, then they don't exist. Then you can't collect the data. You can't demonstrate that there is a bias. You can't measure. You can't fix. You can't advocate. So I'm, that's definitely my position on this. It's a little biased, so I'll just put it out there. Yeah, 100 percent. One thing we did um, this year, too, and I don't know how many people like, send out the post-interview um, survey afterward, the post-rank day mm -hmm. survey. Um, and so as part of that, we did put an option in to, to like, identify if you're LGBTQ afterward, but I'll try to um, you know, change and improve our practices moving forward. Does anybody else do that? No. So that might be an option. Yeah. I think that's honestly one of the more important questions, one that you guys have, right? Like, is there anything in our program that made you not feel comfortable here? Yeah, but yeah. yeah. What can we do better? You know, right. What, 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 what have we missed? You know, why, why, mm -hmm. why, why did we miss it? So, um, so I think, yes, having a statement like that, that maybe it's broad and reasonable, yes, that is really helpful. And there's an opportunity also to put, obviously, a free text comment if you want to. So, you know, check the box. Yeah. Um, in our program comments, I mean, we ask, you know, what we could do better. and then, you know. The one thing that we get almost uniformly positive of like what have we done well for the day is calling attention to the fact that we support diversity. And I mean, you know, being in Richmond, Virginia, where in the 15 years prior to me taking over as program director, we had two underrepresented minorities ever in the program, I got a steep hill to climb. But the steep hill is different and people know that now, I think, and that's getting out there and so hopefully you know, it's, it's, it's continuing to work on it. It's never done. Yeah. Yeah, and we have a very active diversity. And in fact, our diversity, one of our <laughs> leaders is in the back as well. And promoting that on your website and when you're interviewing and getting your residents engaged and listening to residents because sometimes I don't know I and mean, I don't know exactly what to do, but to put out a survey and just to be welcoming and, and stick I think those are all great ideas. I'm curious though, Caitlin, how did you how did you, did you disclose on your heiress application at all? I did not. did not. I did not, nor in my interviews. Would you have done it differently now, or? Um, I think it just didn't fit, you know? I wasn't, it wasn't like a major research uh, area of mine, and I was not like a, in a leadership role in, in sort of like the queer activities in my med school, so it felt like fluff to put it in there that I just kind of went to the like, social events, and um, so, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm being honest about my commitments, and uh, so it, it just didn't have a place there. Had there been a box, I think it would have been a logical demographic thing, and it, I think I stressed out more about the how to disclose and how to slip this in in seemingly unrelated ways um, than if it had just been like, this is my age, this is my location, this is where I was born, yes, I'm clear, da, 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 I'm moving on, you know, that would have been fine or less stressful for me. So, so Caitlin and Abby did, um, I think one pulse ago, uh, did a, for the ADM article, did kind of the pro con versus out versus not out. And it's very interesting because it just, you know, gives different perspectives and it's probably worth a couple minutes of people's read um, time to look, go back and look at what drove them to be out or not. So. Got a question. I have a quick question. Uh, when I was in med school, um, it wasn't very long ago, it was like uh, four, uh, maybe like 10 years ago? Has it really been that long? Insane. Um, I remember uh, one of my friends was bisexual and she was the president of our LGBTQ um, group in the med school. There were three other uh, people in leadership roles one of them was straight, uh, one of them was bisexual, and one of them was a gay man. Um, all three stepped down before their fourth year because they did not want to have an association uh, with that group because they came up to me because I went and talked to them because my friend was devastated 
So I talked to them, like, why are you doing this? And they said, we're happy to help. We, we will help in any way that you want, me to, want us to, but we don't want that on our resume. Um, and ironically, I stepped in and I helped out my friend. And because I did, did that, like, 10 years ago, my current chair appointed me the diversity ambassador because he was like, why is there, why, why were you, uh, you know, why were you the president, co-president of this community and, or this, you know, society? Um, I, th I thought it was, it was just poetic justice that that happened, but I, I guess my question is, is that still something that medical students are afraid of? Yes. Yeah. And how, how do we make, how do we change that? <laughs> because, sorry, forget I asked the second question. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that I, Joel pointed out, uh, that, that's a big accomplishment to take out of your application. I think in a lot of ways, um, burying this for uh, SGM applicants does them a disservice in that they aren't able to showcase their accomplishments if they do something like that. And also that um, they miss out on some of the recruitment. Like if there's targeted diversity recruitment, they're now not invited. They're not necessarily put on the preferential rank list or anything like that. So I, I think um, making it more aware to applicant pools that we do recognize that as an asset because we value diversity for all these other metrics that we know it benefits. And we see you and we want to see you if you want us to see you, you know, kind of thing. Um, but I think we're over time, yeah. so. But no, 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 you. and just quick, I will say, like, in today's day and age, different from five years ago, like, cannot overstate social media. Like, yeah. get your feelers out there, put your message out there, because the kids today are listening, and those are the kids that are majoring in bio right now, that are going to be applying in a few years. It's just going to take time for that momentum, but uh, social media will be a big help in that, so. Thank you also, guys. quick plug for our mixer. Oh, yeah. um, if you haven't signed up, we only have nine it's slots tonight. left. Um, free dinner, free drinks. 68 is here in the Mirage at Cravings. Um, so, queer folk and I, allies, I can sign please. Up if you want to hit me up and great. Okay. before the cool. end. And thank you so much to all yes, our panelists. Thanks, panelists. We really appreciate all your insights. <laughs>